We're going to go on an excursion into artificial intelligence. AI, machine learning, big data, it's everywhere. But what's the difference between it all? And further, what does it mean for our world today? Welcome to part one of our AI series. I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering, and this is The Uncommon Engineer. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. <laughs> Today our guest is Professor Justin Romberg, here to give us a primer on AI. He's a professor and researcher in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Georgia Tech. Welcome to the program, Justin. It's great to be here. I think this is the first podcast I've ever done. Awesome. So you can't go, it seems like, an hour with someone not talking about artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, big data. Um, and you, because so many of our listeners are high schoolers or folks that aren't engineers or mathematicians, can you say a little bit about, from a high level, what artificial intelligence is and, and what it means to us? Sure. Uh, I mean, I guess it's a, a little tricky to define. Is the word is the definition of the word is sort of in flux constantly, uh, especially these days with it being such a hot topic. Uh, I think when it was, you know, the thought of artificial intelligence was first conceived, maybe it was by Alan Turing when he was laying down sort of the modern, uh, the fundamentals of modern computation. Maybe it was, uh, you know, when you, a machine can fool somebody into thinking that they're human, right? And the way he sort of posited this was if you're having a conversation with someone who's on the other side of a screen, you ask them questions, they reply through the monitor if you can, you know, determine whether or not the person on the other side is a human or not. And, you know, that uh, kind of definition continued on, I think, for the next few decades, or is basically like, you know, what, what researchers were looking for was some kind of like emergent, emergent intelligence that would somehow like, you know, act human in a human way. I don't think that's quite uh, what people mean by it right now. Um, one of the things that you hear <clears throat> often coupled with AI uh, is machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, and so whereas I think the general public hears about AI all the time, maybe less so machine learning, but in our communities, people kind of use those two terms together. Can you say a little bit more about machine learning as it relates to AI or how, what's the difference? Sure. Yeah. Uh, some people use the, people use these words in totally different ways. Uh, so many people think machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. I don't uh, quite believe that. Uh, so I would say machine learning is sort of a way to come up with an algorithm that's data driven. So I guess in like classical statistics, which machine learning kind of builds on. You have this idea of, okay, I have this bunch of data and I'm sort of a handcrafted decision rule uh, about how to make a decision. Uh, machine learning, I kind of, kind of the philosophy of machine learning is to throw all of that to the side uh, and just try to learn the rules automatically. Uh, and, you know, that it has been tremendously successful, again, in areas where, you know, two things are true. One is there's a lot of data to learn from. Uh, you know, that's one of, you know, the differences between machine learning and human learning it actually takes many, many examples for a machine to learn something useful. Uh, and the, um, the second place is useful is places where maybe we didn't have great models before. So, you know, we have great models to like how the planets move, uh, even fluid flow, like other physical systems. You know, we've had great, fantastic differential equations for, for 200 years. But for doing things like, you know, figuring out or describing what a sailboat is or what a fire hydrant looks at, you know, there were heuristics for that in the image processing and computer vision communities. But there weren't any, they, and they worked well enough, right? But uh, really, letting the sort of machine figure that out on their own, that was really a watershed in those fields for, for things where you didn't really know how to uh, uh, describe things in mathematical terms, which you're kind of trying to anyway. You know, when you were talking about the, the Alan Turing, so that's, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, you know, it brought to mind uh, the <clears throat> computer HAL. Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. Oh, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? That's what many people view artificial intelligence 
in that sense, like, oh, my goodness, this computer's going to take over the world. But then, the, you know, and like I said, that's been around for decades. And then things kind of went quiet. That's right. Until whatever, five or eight or 10 years ago, when people started talking about artificial intelligence. What do you think is it that caused that resurgence either in that in the research area or why why now? Why is it all all of a sudden hot? Uh, I think there are two kind of well-known reasons for why now. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of a, the two things that are at the core of any artificial intelligence al algorithm, and that's data and computation, right? I mean, uh, our ability to compute things, you know, that power has gone up exponentially for decades now, too. And then I think what's special in the last couple decades is our ability to collect data digitally. Uh, and so all these, you know, tremendous advances in artificial intelligence, being able to automatically recognize and describe things in a scene off a picture from a camera, or to be able to take like uh, text transcriptions and extract some kind of semantic meaning from them, all the great advances that have happened in that over the past 10 to 15 years uh, are really in fields like those where there's been a tremendous amount of data uh, available. You know, uh, and one of the things that you hear an, an awful lot about is, you know, the singularity, the the point at which a computer would be so powerful and have such capability that we would lose control. That's right. Um, talk about that. Where, 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 you know, do you worry about these things? Should the public worry about these things? Or where, where, where are we on that kind of singularity event that may or may not occur? Right. I mean, I think, first of all, by its very nature, we might not know when that's occurring until maybe it's too late. Uh, I mean, my, I personally, like of all the things I worry about in terms of application of artificial intelligence, that's really not on the list. I have kind of more mundane uh, uh, but practical concerns uh, about people losing jobs, being uh, uh, replaced by autonomy. Uh, you know, all this talk of self-driving cars, cars we had earlier. Uh, the number one occupation for males worldwide is driver right now. Uh, so there are massive displacements that might occur. Again, we, we don't, no one knows exactly what's going to happen. Uh, so, and there seems to be a small portion say, of our uh, 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 people in politics that seem to recognize this and maybe be prepared uh, or at least prepare society for what might happen uh, when this happens. So my media concerns run more along that line in terms of effect on the uh, uh, world economy and, and human well-being. Uh, that's not to say things like the singularity and the machines taking over. They're certainly not impossible. Uh, uh, in theory or practice, but uh, uh, it's it's not something that crosses my radar on a daily basis. You know, one of the ways that uh, people listening might be experiencing uh, machine learning or things like it that we've been talking about is, you know, the infamous "I'm not a robot." Here's nine pictures. Click on all the pictures that have fire hydrants in them. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about you know how people might relate to that experience and our AI and machine learning? Th that's right. I I would say those are great examples of actually the failures of artificial intelligence and how we can capitalize on them. So, you know, the reason it knows you're not a robot is you are solving a problem that uh, is not easy for a computer to solve right now. And so you verify that by solving an image recognition problem that uh, uh, dot, that the state of the algorithms just can't untangle. Uh, you know, what's super interesting though is oftentimes when you do that, that gets fed back as a trading sample <laughs> and might actually help uh, artificial intelligence algorithms in the future uh, make better decisions. Current limits of artificial intelligence is it can't identify and so it needs the human to do that. But, but over time, someone will accumulate the decisions you made. And when it sees that image again, we'll be able to automatically do the work that, that you did. That's, isn't that the whole That's point right. of machine there, learning? There's a constant arms race on right now with these failures of artificial intelligence. I mean, and part of this is, there, I guess there's a whole sort of subfield now of like adversarial machine learning or adversarial intelligence where, you know, you have a picture and it very reliably tells you about the fire hydrant in the picture. And then you make just a very extremely small perturbation to all of the pixels 
right? Uh, a perturbation where if you use the classical model would make absolutely no change in what happened next. But because you have these sort of massively cascading representations that are very rich, uh, it makes an error. You can actually make it classify any number of different things by adding these small perturbations. Now, that perturbation has to be very carefully chosen. It itself takes a lot of computation to figure out what that should be. They tend not to happen in practical situations. We don't know, though, uh, what might be happening or not, but it's raising all kinds of interesting questions about you know, what we're expecting from mission-critical algorithms uh, in terms of performance guarantees. You know, so that, if you ask me, that's reassuring <laughs> <laughs> that that these uh, the algorithms that that we're using for machine learning and artificial intelligence are uh, artificial intelligence are robust, um, as long as there's not somebody sneakily an behind the scenes, an adversary trying to mess things up. That these algorithms, when when crunching on enormous amounts of data, you know, do the right thing. You know, one of the other things that um, I think a lot of people experience, it's not in my home yet, we're, re we're uh, resisting, you know, are the home assistants like Alexa. Um, and so, you know, I I'm, I'm really curious your, your thought on, you know, how those systems work today, how they're going to work in the future, how, how much it plays into what is we're talking about artificial intelligence. And I guess the real question is, is Alexa really listening? And anything you can do to provide the insight on that would be great. I know I'm, I'm serious. I think you know, can can you share more about what uh, those are the kinds of things people are experiencing? That's right. So uh, Alexa is in my home. Uh, my kids love her. I have 10 year old twins. Uh, I can't get her to do fundamentally useful things like never play a Taylor Swift song again. She was under direct <laughs> orders, but <laughs> somehow she still comes on. But to the point is like, uh, is Alexa always listening in a way? Yes, right? Whenever you say the word Alexa or whatever the keyword you're putting, it wakes up so you know uh, that it's listening. Uh, and do we know exactly how much the Amazon devices are listening, processing? Well, we don't know. We only hear rumors, right? Only uh, a couple, probably the software engineers and design people on the team really know what's going on. And that, I think, brings us to another kind of like fundamental trade off. It just uh, even goes past artificial intelligence is like, you know, what are we willing to trade some degree of privacy for, right? I mean, I think. Most of our concerns with people recording us in our house, they're mostly philosophical and not practical, right? And we talk about mundane things, and yet it is still seems wrong. Uh, uh, fundamentally somehow, at least to people my age, right? And so we feel like we're giving up something in principle. Uh, there could be dramatic things we're giving up in practice. Maybe we just don't quite know uh, what they are yet. And it also feels like it's a decision that, you know, we did not quite make uh, consciously uh, moving forward. Uh, and so... I think it's great that topics like this are starting to get broad discussion because I think it's a, uh, a, a very important philosophical topic about where we stand as a society. It, it, that, that's a really interesting <clears throat> point because so many of our systems, whether they're communication systems, whether they're computing systems, were designed to just make things work, to do the job that we were envisioning them to do as fast as they can, the mo as accurately as they can, without regard for security, without That's regard for privacy. These 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 pieces that are now becoming so much more important, and it's great to hear that people are starting to kind of. It's not just about being right. It's not just to be about efficient. It's also being about some pieces need to be private, or some people want to be private, and. Is is there a way to describe more about how those systems would ultimately be designed? Because I think the way that you're describing it is, hey, we have lots of data. We've got machine learning algorithms and AI that come up with a solution. How would we then say, no, this right. thing also needs to be private or it needs to be secure? Right. I mean, to be honest, I think the best solution maybe is not in the realm of engineering. It's really in uh, it's sort of the realm of transparency or like having very clear guidelines about uh, what companies or the government can do with data like this and having to demonstrate that this is exactly what they're doing. Uh, I think having uh, very clear expectations and policy about these aspects, uh, that would 
I think that would be the most important thing uh, because you're right. Like when you're trying to solve an interesting problem or trying to make money, uh, that's the goal. Uh, and uh, other, you have to take over uh, parts of other people's lives, take something away from their privacy. That's that, that that's a price other people are willing to, to pay. So if some of our listeners, probably high school students or, or, or college students, what would you say if if they wanted to get into machine learning, AI, big data, and let's say they're an engineer or not an engineer? What would you what advice would you give to them? To um, it, this is obviously an extraordinarily exciting field. That's uh, right. So much of our future is going to be oriented around. What advice would you give them on how to prepare them for a for a career in this space? Okay, I will give one very specific piece of advice, which is w- what we were sort of hinting at earlier. And that is a study applied mathematics. I mean, uh, if you want to know uh, really what happens in machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, if you know probability and statistics and linear algebra, like these are the tools that kind of make modern day sci- modern day data science possible. Uh, and not only that, it's like you don't know what the interesting problem set will be 10 years from now. Like I, like you, Steve, was not raised in this current environment of artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? And uh, yet, you know, I was trained with the right mathematical b- background to completely appreciate and contribute uh, to, uh, to these things now that they've you know, r- revealed their importance. And so as an engineer, I'm heartened by the fact you didn't say learn coding and <laughs> use the use the Google or Microsoft suite for artificial intelligence. And and but I think that that's really important for folks to hear for for the students that are in your research group. What kind of backgrounds do those do students have if they wanted to? I mean, because you're you're doing research at the cutting edge of this space. So very, very mathematical, very advanced. What kind of background would a student have to come in to do research in your group? That's so most of my students are very strong in mathematics. So a large component of my personal research uh, is really on the the theory side of things. I still write papers that have theorems in them. Uh, but I, I do also, like I do, you know, as an a engineering professor at Georgia Tech, I, of course, very much value things being put into action. So I do have a part of my research program, which is actually really applied. Uh, and I have students, when they first come in, they know what they want to do. They want to do some theory. They want to do something. And I have students that come in thinking they want to do one thing and their thesis ends up going in completely the other direction. I've seen it go both ways. I had people that were really interested in theory ended up, you know, doing something very probably like coming up with a, a reinforcement learning controller for a micro circuit. And then I had other students that came in. They are great coders, fantastic, started them off with some computer vision stuff. And they ended up like, you know, Proving theorems about algebraic structures of different types of matrices. So it's uh, uh, I, I, you never know, and they really don't know, and uh, until they get going. But in general, I mean, you can't go wrong again by uh, having an extremely strong background in uh, in applied mathematics. <clears throat> One of the things which we always ask uh, our guests here on the Uncommon Engineer is, yeah. Justin, what makes you an uncommon engineer? I can tell you some ways that Georgia Tech has changed me, and it's re- actually related to what I, I just said. Uh, when I came here, I was very focused on mathematics. I wasn't as I just described at all. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted everything on a firm mathematical footing. Otherwise, I didn't feel like I could proceed or understand something. Uh, when I came to Georgia Tech, this is just a huge place full of people doing all kinds of interesting things. Uh, that I actually started to talk to people that built imaging systems, people that built distributed processing systems, uh, and we've and st- struck up meaningful collaborations with them. Uh, you know, uh, m- you know, a decent percentage of my paper output right now is collaborations with other faculty at ECE. You know, doing things like figuring out how distributed optimization algorithms might be applied to doing comp- computing with multiple cores. Uh, figuring out how some like abstract math we figured out for solving a certain type of system of equations could be applied in underwater acoustics to uh, to track ships. Uh, so I, that I you know I really sort of value that work too, uh, and always devote a certain portion of my time to. Um, I, uh, I I I find that a, val- a valuable piece of my identity at least.
Well, we just want to thank you for uh, coming on The Uncommon Engineer uh, sure. today, Justin. We're extraordinarily uh, fortunate to have uh, you here on campus, folks sure. like you that really are committed to uh, good, solid mathematics, but also those applications. And I know that you care tons for your students. And so uh, we're lucky to have you here. And thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Tune in next month for part two of our AI series, all about bias and fairness in algorithms. That's all for now from The Uncommon Engineer. I'm Steve McLaughlin, and thanks for listening.